the Black Lives Matter movement that's been going on that originated in the United States has been of a great inspiration to me personally and to a lot of people in this city and country. And I think that that's because it has to do with things that are happening in our lives, not just what we see happening in another country. And I want to talk a lot about that uh, this evening. But let me just tell you about myself. I came to the city uh, just about 11 years ago. Uh, I was born in Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, my parents are immigrants from Sierra Leone in West Africa, and they came to Canada to Red Deer in the 70s. Um, interesting choice of cities to live in, but, you know, they made it with a lot of help from other people who were there and a lot of determination and a lot of good luck. We moved to Ontario when I was five years old. I went to school in Oshawa. That's where I grew up. Went to school in Oshawa, high school in Oshawa and Whitby. I'm a French immersion graduate, so I do speak French as well. And I always love language. I always love language. But I didn't know what I wanted to do. I got into university at Queen's, and I went because it was a prestigious school, I was told. And people said, oh, you, you know, you should go. I dropped out after two years because I had no idea what I was doing there. And... Um, this started my adventure in Toronto because I came here with no money. I came here with no job. I came here with no place to live, but I had always wanted to be in this city. So luckily, I got here. I struggled for a really long time. I did a whole bunch of different jobs, including working just down the road here at a community center called Youth Link Inner City. My first job was as a youth worker in what's called a harm reduction facility. We worked with a lot of young people between the ages of 16 and 24 who were um, underhoused or homeless, who were dealing with a lot of addiction issues, mental health issues, uh, past issues of abuse in their families. You know, in the, in the first couple of years that I started working at this job, a study came out saying that 50% of the kids who were on the streets in Canada had been in the child welfare system, meaning that the government was supposed to have taken care of them and the government failed. So that's my background. I always loved language. I was always interested in activism. I saw how much the young people that I was working with were struggling, and so I wanted to do something about it. When I was 24 years old, I ran for Toronto City Council unsuccessfully in this neighborhood that we're standing and sitting in right now. But that taught me a lot about the system and about politics. Um, and a few years after that, as I was kind of keeping my own blog and just doing what people do, which is ranting about the things that bothered me, I was approached by a publication called Torontoist and they wanted to reprint something that I had written. And I was shocked, but I got addicted after that. And like Shauna, actually, the G20 was one of my very formative experiences later on that summer as a journalist. So the very first summer that I started writing, I was covering the G20. I was also at the Novotel when hundreds of people were getting arrested. I was at the detention center. I learned a lot. I saw a lot about the police. And uh, you know, I have my own experiences with police, that which maybe some of you know. But um, it was a great education. And over the last five years, after becoming a print journalist, um, you know, more recently, started doing TV hits. Got invited to Sun News, the now defunct Sun News Network, and people invited me on there to talk about issues and started doing television. Started getting invited on the radio on News Talk 1010, where I now have my own program every Sunday at 3 p.m. <laughs> um, so now I do TV, I do radio, I do print. I'm a journalist, I have no idea how this all happened. It's a blessing, it's amazing. But I never went to school for this. I don't recommend people to try and take the route that I took, but I was very blessed, I got a lot of help along the way, a lot of support, and I'm still getting it. Um, so that's my professional background. Um, I've become known more recently, <laughs> it's very similar, uh, for something that I didn't actually expect to happen, which was one of the issues that I've been carding, uh, carding, one of the issues that I've been talking about over the last several years 
is the issue of police carding. And for those of you who don't know, police carding is the Toronto police practice of walking up to somebody on the street, stopping somebody in their car, not because they are a, sus a suspect in a criminal investigation. That's critical. And this is the police's own admission. This is not my definition. But even though you're not suspected of any crime, you are stopped and you are asked for your personal identification. And your identification is entered into a database. Or, in many cases, if the police have gotten familiar enough with you or if they can get enough details on you, they won't even tell you that you're actually being documented. They will do it covertly. And then your information goes into the database. The police claim over the last several years that they have collected 1.8 million contact cards on over 1 million unique Torontonians. There were 2.7 million people in the city of Toronto at the last census, so do the math. Why? Because they call it police work. They call it intelligence-led policing. And this is how they want to run the city now, is that you might not have done anything today. I didn't stop you because you did something today, but what if you did something in the future? It would be really convenient for me as the police to then have some information on you. When I learned about this practice, I was just completely shocked, but it rang a bell. Because I told you I went to university at Queen's in Kingston, Ontario. It was at that time that this activity first started happening to me, and I didn't even know what was going on. But everywhere I went, I was followed. I was followed driving my car around Kingston, Ontario by the police. I got so paranoid that I would just take trips riding around anywhere just to see, like, is this really happening? Are they actually following me? I would get stopped on the street, singled out from my white friends. I went to the police station to complain. I got so scared at one point. Moved to Toronto, thought it was going to be different. Multicultural city, diversity our strength, blah, blah. No, worse, much worse. Happened the first week that I was here. Stopped for no reason walking down the street with a book under my arm. Not doing anything. They're just fishing, though, because a black man walking down the street in his own city must be up to something. He must have something that we can get, keep for later. Right? So that's the mentality. And it's not a couple of bad apples, by the way. It's not a couple of racist police out there who are doing this. 8% of Toronto's population, 8.5% at the last census was black. But we were 27% of the people carded in 2013. So that's not a couple of bad apples, guys. That's systemic. That's the police believing that if they stop me, they're going to get something. Or that they just want to give me a hard time, which I think is a lot more often the case that I just don't deserve to be able to walk in peace and freedom in my own street because of the way that I look. I started writing about this for Toronto was three years ago, and I wrote column after column after column, and I went to community events, and I learned from people who had been documenting this for a lot longer than I had even known about it, right? And I was just blown away. But I wasn't getting the response that I thought I ought to be getting for such a crazy story. And I was one of the only people who was following it. The Toronto Star broke this whole thing open in 2012 with a huge report called Known to Police. That's what they called their story, their feature, uh, their series on this whole issue, Known to Police. And it documented just how thoroughly the police were taking the information of people who were innocent, but specifically black people, and more specifically, young black men. So... When I noticed that my journalism and the star's journalism, quite frankly, wasn't having the impact that I thought it should, and I'd gone to meetings on this for three years and written about it for three years and interviewed people for three years, and I saw that nothing was changing, I decided that I couldn't be a journalist on this issue any longer. So I wrote a story on April 16th. April 16th was the day that the police board, under the leadership of our mayor, John Tory, 
in their wisdom, said, oh, you know, we're going to keep carting going. Can't be that bad. And all the safeguards that the community wanted, you know, a receipt, like you get when you get a, you get a speeding ticket or you get a traffic infraction, they give you a receipt, right? Just because you did something wrong doesn't mean that the police don't have to be accountable to you, except if you're black, okay? And I'm going to explain what I mean by this, except that you're black, because it happens to white people too, but there's something specific going on here. Let me get back to that. No receipts approved by the police board. No destruction of all of this information in the database that have been collected for no reason. No need for the police to tell you, you're not being arrested right now, you're not being detained right now. If you want to go, you can go. The police board approved carding without any of those regulations on April 16th, and I knew it was coming. So that morning, I filed a preview of the issue for Torontoist, and I called my editor, and I said, this is the last time I'm doing a story on this issue for our newspaper as a reporter. I can't report on this issue anymore. It's hurting me too much. It's affecting our community too much, and I need to do something. So I signed up to speak at that police board meeting that day, and I've been an activist on this issue ever since. Now, ever since is only two months ago, but a lot happened in the last two months. Um, Let me get back. When I say black people, okay, and this is happening to black people and the excuse is that it needs to be done to black people. And some people don't understand why I would say that because it's happening to a lot of people. It is us who are the justification though for why this practice has to continue. We are the scapegoat. And if you listen to our leadership, you will understand what I'm saying. Because when you ask the police, why do you need to collect information on innocent people? If someone is not doing anything wrong, why should they be in a police database? What do they say? Gang violence. Who are they talking about, guys? Be honest. Who are they talking about when they say gang violence? Hell's Angels? No. Who are they talking about? They say priority neighborhoods. Priority neighborhoods. Who are they talking about, guys? Who are they talking about? Let's be honest. Who are you talking about when you say priority neighborhoods? Does it matter? No, because in every neighborhood in Toronto, a black person is more likely to be stopped than a white person. In Rosedale, in Moore Park, in Forest Hill, in Willowdale, a black person in Willowdale is more likely to be stopped by the police where no black people live than a white person. So you tell me what's going on. Oftentimes I talk about blackness in this city and in this country, and people say it's not as bad as the United States. And this is actually why I'm writing a book, because this is how blackness actually works, is that I'm supposed to accept being terrorized by the police in my own city because I'm not being lynched like they are in the United States. That's how blackness is supposed to operate. That's how people see it, is that I shouldn't complain because some black person somewhere else has it worse than me. How demoralizing is that? How disrespectful is that to my situation and to the situation of all of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of black people in Toronto that this is happening to, that the only thing that our brothers and sisters can say to us is that it's not as bad as somewhere else. We deserve better than that. But blackness is a scapegoat. And that's why a police practice that is seen to be targeting black people is allowed to continue and is justified, even by a black police chief who himself gets carded, by the way. So I'm saying this because this is not about a rogue few police officers, and it's not about a practice that had good intentions and then went astray like the police will tell you. It's about anti-black racism, period. That's what this is about. It is about a society where, and this is Toronto that I'm talking about now, a black student in the Toronto District School Board who is 13 years old, a grade eight student, a black student in the TDSB is three times more likely than a white student to be suspended. Although black people only make up about eight or 9% of the population in the GTA, we make up 65% of the children in the care of the state, 65. How is that possible? How is it possible that black inmates who go to federal prison in Canada get put into solitary confinement more often than anyone else, even though they're not assessed more than anyone else to be a risk to their fellow inmates or the guards? How is that possible, guys? 
I'm sorry to give you the bad news, but this is the world and the city and the country that you are living in. And I can sit behind a computer and I can write about it, but that's not good enough for me. It shouldn't be good enough for any of you either. You have to get engaged, which brings me to the whole idea of activism. I wrote a piece in the Toronto Star recently, and it relates again to what Shauna did. I talked about seeing somebody on the street here. You go outside, you leave this wonderful gathering that we're all at tonight. And you see somebody out here stopped on the street, a black person being interrogated by the police. I wrote a piece for the Toronto Star saying, you know what you should do in that situation? You should just walk up to that person. Forget about the police, don't even look at them. Just walk up to that person and say, hey, you all right? Are you okay? You know why, guys? Because this wall between you and your brother and your sister, that's the wall that the police require to be maintained in order for them to keep terrorizing us like this. So you can read about it. You can educate yourself about it all you want to. But when it really comes down to it, you actually have to do something. You have to act. You can't just keep the knowledge inside. It's not good enough. You can't even just talk about it with other people and complain about it. You actually have to use that knowledge and put it into action. I got a lot of credit. I wrote a piece in Toronto Life, it went viral. I got on every news show, every radio show. I got a call from the mayor, said he wanted to talk to me. By the way, if Mayor Tory ever tells you that he wants to meet you um, off the record, don't believe him because he told me that he wanted to meet me off the record and then he went calling my name in the street to everybody saying, I've been meeting with Desmond Cole and you know, we've been making a lot of progress. as if it was me that he needed to be listening to and not the black people who have been coming to police services board meetings for years telling them about this problem that they refuse to fix, that they still refuse to completely fix, although we made some great strides at the police services board meeting last week. So you have to act because just the knowledge and just the conversation is not enough. I um, I was gonna say that, uh, I'm sorry, I've just lost myself here. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> don't encourage me anymore, trust me. Once I get the mic in my hand, it's a problem. Um, no, I'm just saying that I was upset because I got treated like this was about me suddenly. Like, oh, Desmond, your story was so compelling. Oh, Desmond, you know, you really opened up a lot of people's eyes. How come you haven't been listening to the people at Jane and Finch who have been organizing around this for years, though? Or at the Hub in Weston Mount Dennis, where I went to my first meeting ever about police carding and wrote about it. How come you haven't been listening to them? Why did it take my story? What was so special about me? And are you even listening to any of those people now that you heard my story? Or are you still walking by them on the street as the police are terrorizing them, right? What have you done differently since you heard that story? Um, that's what activism means to me. And I got lucky, guys. I started working on that story for Toronto Life in December. It just happened to come out the week after the police board foolishly endorsed carding again and said we have to keep this practice and then we had a black police chief be elected and this is what kind of like turned everybody's minds upside down because a lot of people thought oh well the black police chief will side with the black residents and he'll say that carding is wrong and that it's bad and then when Mark Saunders was like no nah, that's cool people were like whoa he's black and he said it's okay well maybe it is okay no I'm really confused now <laughs> You know what I mean? So that really kept this whole conversation alive and it was like my piece came out at just the right time to strike this chord and to have all this conversation happening. But it wasn't about me and my story. It was about the Ontario Human Rights Commission. It was about the Law Union of Ontario. It was about a hundred different community programs that I've been to where young people actually go and they tell their youth leaders, hey, this is what happened to me with the cops this week. 
And it takes so much courage for them to be able to talk about this stuff because they're the victim. Imagine being 16. I went to Central Tech High School a couple weeks ago. I was with 200 or so kids, almost all of them black. And I said, think about it guys, high school. I said, how many of you guys have ever been stopped by the police and asked for identification and you didn't know why? And about 85% of the hands in the room went up. High school. That's who our police are going after, talking to you about gangs and priority neighborhoods. And when I asked them, how many of you have had this happen to you more than once, nearly every hand stayed in the air. So those young people are brave to come out and tell their story to anybody because they're being targeted and victimized. But we need to support them as the grown people as the business leaders, as the entrepreneurs, as the community voices. We have a lot more privilege than they do. And we need to go out there and start supporting the people who have had the courage to speak up about this happening to them because it's extremely hard. And in some cases, it can have repercussions for you in your own community if you start speaking out about what the police are doing to you. So everybody in this room is an activist, in my opinion. Everybody in this room, maybe some of you guys even have some of these stories. Maybe this has happened to you or to a family member. I can't tell you how many people I've had come up to me and tell me their story since I shared mine. But that's what this is about. It's about telling stories and then taking that to the next level and saying, we're gonna act. When we see something in our community that's wrong, we're not just gonna talk. We're actually gonna take the next step and we're gonna act. So I encourage you guys, this fight is not over. We got some really good measures passed at the police services board meeting last week. Things that people have been asking for for a long time. But we didn't get them all. And that means that our police are still gonna have a lot of too much free reign, in my opinion, to go around and do things to us that they have no right to do. I was born in this country, not that that should matter. But the highest law of Canada is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And every one of the times that I've been stopped for no reason by the police, they have violated my charter right not to be arbitrarily detained. And if it's happened to you, your charter right has been violated. So I would encourage all of you guys, over this summer, when the kids are going to be out playing in the street, and when the cops are going to be rolling around and the Tavis, the Toronto Anti-Violence Intervention Strategy, the gang and gun cops are going to be rolling around in the neighborhoods, I encourage you guys, think about it. When you see something going on in the street, think about your decision and whether or not you're going to walk, whether or not you're going to talk, whether or not you're just going to look. And by the way, being a witness, just coming up and standing and not saying a damn thing, and watching the police do the job that they're supposed to be doing in public can act as an excellent deterrent if you don't have the courage to go up and say anything. But do something. Educate yourself and then use that information to act. Because people who are in a lot worse position than you, they need your support. So I'll end it there and thank you very much.